So I'm a classical liberal. Um, I believe in the doctrine of inalienable natural rights as set out by John Locke in the second treatise of government. And I think the legitimacy of the state derives from its being the best guarantor of those inalienable natural rights. And my preferred metaphor is the state as a gardener, nurturing an environment in which people are able to pursue their own good in their own way, provided they don't attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to obtain it. And um, as the PPEs amongst you, I'm sure, have recognized, that is a paraphrase of a passage by J.S. Mill in the introductory to On Liberty. So as soon as the state goes beyond that role and violates those rights in the name of some ultimate goal, it loses its legitimacy. Uh, which is to say, I believe in equal rights, equal treatment and equal opportunities and celebrate the victories of the Chartists, the suffragettes, civil rights activists, women's rights activists, gay rights activists and others who've compelled the state to recognise those rights, but I don't believe in equality of outcome. As Hayek and others have pointed out, the difficulty with end state equality is that the attempt to bring it about invariably involves the violation of our natural rights and it rarely succeeds. Uh, never succeeds might be more accurate. The standard Marxist justification for all the terrible crimes committed by communist dictators is you can't make an omelette without breaking eggs, to which George Orwell famously replied, where's the omelette? Um, when I say that the attempt to bring about end state equality inevitably means the violation of natural rights, I don't just mean that the creation of the socialist Shangri-La uh, usually involves the confiscation of property by the state and the execution of the ruling class. Even after that initial levelling, it's unlikely that the state will just wither away, to use Engels' phrase, because natural abilities are distributed unequally. Um, behavioural scientists have taught us that it's just flat out wrong to think that the varying levels of ability and success we see in society around us are solely determined by social, economic and historical forces. Rather, they are at least partly determined by individual genetic differences. And if you equalize the environment, you exacerbate the effect of those genetic differences. You don't eliminate them. So um, uh, incidentally, that might not be true of other species. So um, uh, species in which there's less genetic variation. Um, the recently deceased uh, e. O. Wilson, famous entomologist who devoted his life to the study of ants, said about socialism, wonderful theory, wrong species. Um, so it's a dangerous fantasy to think that once you've eradicated socio-economic inequality, human nature will flatten out accordingly, that you can return to year zero, as the Khmer Rouge put it. On the contrary, individual differences between human beings rooted in biology will stubbornly refuse to wither away, which means that an egalitarian society uh, can only be maintained by a brutally coercive state that is constantly intervening to correct the inequalities of nature. Uh, this is a point well made by the libertarian economist Murray Rothbard in Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Nature. Quote, at the heart of the egalitarian left is the pathological belief that there is no structure of reality, that all the world is a tabula rasa that can be changed at any moment in any desired direction by the mere exercise of human will. In short, that reality can be instantly transformed by the mere wish or whim of human beings, unquote. Seen in that light, it's not surprising that nearly every hard left socialist experiment has resulted in the suppression of free speech, the imprisonment and torture of political dissidents, economic stagnation, and of course, mass starvation, which was the main cause of unnecessary deaths that occurred under communist regimes during the 20th century, estimated to be around 100 million.